The food that we eat and drink makes up our diet. We need different nutrients in our food for different purposes. Our bodies need fats and carbohydrates for energy. Proteins are needed for growth and repair. Small amounts of vitamins and minerals keep our bodies healthy. To find out whether a food contains fat, carbohydrate or protein, there are some simple tests. We'll be testing bread, nuts and grape juice. The first test is for fats. Vegetable oil is 100% fat. A simple test is to rub a sample onto a piece of paper and then allow the paper to dry. Hold it in front of a light and a translucent mark indicates the presence of fat. To find out if any of these foods contain fat, first grind the solid food samples in distilled water. A small amount of the liquid from each sample is then smeared onto a filter paper and left to dry. They all look translucent to start with because they're wet, so it's important to leave them to dry for a few minutes. Here are the results. Only the nuts contain fat. Next, carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates are the sugars found in anything sweet. Starchy carbohydrates are found in foods like pasta, potatoes, cereals and rice. A few drops of iodine solution produces a colour change from orange to blue-black. This indicates the presence of starch. So, will any of our foods test positive? Grape juice? Nuts? Or bread? Starch is present in bread, but not in grape juice or nuts. Some sugars, like glucose, maltose and fructose, are called reducing sugars. To test for them, add a few drops of Benedict's reagent and heat gently. Sugar changes the colour from blue through green to a yellow-orange or red. The nearer the final colour is to red, the more reducing sugar is present. So which of these contain reducing sugars? Bread in tube 1, nuts in tube 2 and grape juice in tube 3. Bread and grape juice test positive. The nuts give a mauve colour, not a positive result for a reducing sugar. Finally, protein. Egg white contains a lot of protein. The test for protein is called the Biorette test. This involves adding some sodium hydroxide solution, then running some very dilute copper sulphate solution down the side of the tube. At the top of the mixture, the colour change to mauve shows that protein is present. So, which of these will test positive for protein? Bread in tube 1, nuts in 2, and grape juice in 3. Both the bread and nuts contain protein. Which contains more? Food tests revealed the nutrients in our diet. Some foods contain several, worth knowing given that we all need a balanced diet. An egg sandwich contains protein, starch and fat. Protein in the egg, starch in the bread and fat in the margarine. When you put food in your mouth, it's starting a journey through your digestive system. The digestive system is a tube-like structure up to 9 metres long, running from the mouth to the anus. Some nutrients are made up of large molecules. These have to be broken down into molecules small enough to dissolve in your blood. Only then can your body use them.
This process is called digestion. Digestion starts in your mouth. Your teeth are designed to physically break up food into smaller pieces. At the same time, saliva is released. This moistens the food and contains the digestive enzyme amylase. When you swallow a mouthful of food, it's pushed down your throat into your esophagus. The esophagus leads from your mouth to your stomach. Muscles in the wall of the esophagus contract, pushing the food along. This process is called peristalsis. You can't feel this muscular contraction, but that doesn't mean it isn't happening. To examine the digestive system, doctors can give patients a barium meal. This contains barium sulphate, which shows up black on an X-ray image. The progress of the barium meal can be followed on a screen. It takes about six seconds for a mouthful of food to reach the stomach. This model shows the typical size and shape of your stomach compared to your other organs. The stomach has elastic walls, which stretch as the food collects inside. Every now and again, the stomach muscles contract to churn the food. In the folded lining of the stomach, there are many gastric pits. Each pit contains a gland, which produces gastric juice. Gastric juice is acidic and contains the digestive enzyme pepsin. Pepsin works on protein, like in eggs. Food spends three to four hours in your stomach. Once it's been turned into a liquid, it's released into the first part of the small intestine. Mixing with it is pancreatic juice released from the pancreas. This juice contains amylase, protease and lipase. Amylase completes the digestion of starch. Protease continues the digestion of protein. The margarine in the sandwich contains fat. This is now digested by the lipase. By now, all the digestible material from your sandwich has been broken down into smaller molecules. These are small enough to pass through the lining of the intestine into your blood. The inner surface of the small intestine is lined with thousands of tiny projections called villi. The molecules of digested food can pass into the cells lining the villi and then into the bloodstream. This process is called absorption. The thousands of villi increase the surface area of the small intestine. The intestine wall is also folded, so further increasing its surface area for absorption. Some food can't be broken down and absorbed. Most of this is fibre. It stays in the gut, eventually passing out of the body through the anus. However, its passage through the body is not a waste. It helps keep the whole digestive system working effectively. Which part of the egg sandwich is, in the end, indigestible? Starch, protein and fat are all made up of large molecules. These food molecules must be broken down into smaller ones before they can be used by the body. Digestive enzymes speed up this process. Each enzyme breaks down a particular nutrient. Amylase breaks down starch. Proteases, like pepsin, break down proteins. And lipase breaks down fats. Each enzyme is released at a particular point in the digestive system. In the mouth, amylase is present in saliva. In the stomach, only pepsin is present. Most digestion takes place in the small intestine. pH varies in different parts of the digestive system. Does pH affect the way digestive enzymes work? To find out, first we'll investigate salivary amylase. There's an equal amount of starch solution in each of these three test tubes. A weak acid is added to the first. This solution is pH 3. A neutral solution is added to the second, pH 7. A weak alkali is added to the third, pH 9. Now, the same amount of salivary amylase is placed in each, and immediately a sample of each is tested with iodine to monitor the reaction. 
the iodine turns blue-black because starch is still present. Every two minutes, a drop from each test tube is added to the iodine. If the starch has been digested, the iodine will not change colour. Finally, six minutes into the experiment, at which pH does the amylase appear to work best? Here, salivary amylase works best at pH 7. This is its optimum pH. Next, we investigate pepsin, which is released in the stomach. There's protein, egg white solution, in these three test tubes. An acid is added to the first. A neutral solution is added to the second. An alkali is added to the third. The same amount of pepsin is added to each. As the egg white is digested, it'll change from a cloudy suspension to a clear solution. The solid particles of egg protein are broken down into smaller, soluble particles. The test tube with acid is the only one which clears. In our experiment, the optimum pH for pepsin is pH 3. This is the pH in the stomach due to hydrochloric acid. Digestion continues in the small intestine, with enzymes released by the pancreas. One of these is lipase, needed to digest fats. But this process depends also on the presence of bile salts from the gallbladder. To show this, these three tubes contain some full-fat milk. A weak alkali is added, replicating the conditions in the small intestine. Next, we add an indicator, phenolphthalein. With the weak alkali, it's pink. Bile is added to test tubes 1 and 2. Then, the same amount of lipase is added to test tubes 2 and 3. So, tube 1 contains bile salts. Tube 2 has both lipase and bile salts. Tube 3 has lipase. When fats are digested, they're broken down into glycerol and fatty acids. As the fatty acids neutralise the alkali, the pH level falls. This causes the indicator to lose its pink colour. Acidity increases most rapidly in tube 2, showing that fat is digested fastest in this environment. Tube 2 contains both lipase and bile salts, the optimum condition for digesting fat. As tube 1 shows, bile salts alone don't digest fat. Tube 3 shows that on its own, lipase is slow to digest fat. In tube 2, Bile salts speed up lipase action by breaking up the fat into small droplets. This increases the surface area on which the lipase can act. Hungry for the nutrients in our food, our bodies are well-tuned to create the optimum conditions for each enzyme to work most effectively.